Would you pray with me? Wondrous God, we come this day with our hearts open to you, asking that your spirit would move amongst us, empowering us, renewing us, and strengthening us as we seek to follow you and to, and to engage in those things that build up the common good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Spirituality is in vogue. Religion is not. Growing numbers of people are calling themselves spiritual but not religious. They desire spiritual things but not the institutional baggage that goes along with religion. The question is, what does it mean to be spiritual? And that question forms the heart of Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church. Our Wednesday Bible study is working through 1 Corinthians and, and we've reached the end of chapter 3. So we're, not, we're just at the very beginning of the letter. But what we've seen so far is that Paul is a bit frustrated with this church that he had planted just a few years earlier. He'd been away for a couple of years, and in the meantime, things had gone badly. Things had gone awry. Reports were coming in from all quarters about the, from the congregation about quarrels and fighting and all kinds of misbehavior. We're going to get into some of those misbehaviors on Wednesday. But it's so far, just the quarreling is what we've been looking at. So Paul writes this letter to put things right. And standing at the center of the problems faced by this congregation is a misunderstanding about what it means to be spiritual. This congregation didn't lack in any spiritual gifts. That's what Paul had said. But in Paul's mind, they were lacking in spiritual maturity. They eagerly uh, pursued spiritual things, but they weren't growing into spiritual maturity. And so Paul pointed out the, one of the examples and expressions of this immaturity, and that was the factions that had developed within the congregation. He pointed to groups, some of whom were claiming Paul as their patron. We're, we're Paulinus. And, and others were pointing to Apollos and saying, we're followers of Apollo. And still others said, you know, we're followers of Cephas. Now, if you don't know who Cephas is, it's another name for Peter. And then there was a fourth group, maybe, and those who said, we follow Christ. Now, the question is, what do they mean? You know, in every faith, in, you know, there's all these people around in the, in the Christian, broader Christian community that say we're Christians only. You know, we just follow Jesus. None of these party names for us. We're just followers of Jesus, you know, unlike them. But in the end, these groups are just as complicit as all the others in the factionalism of the church. Now, if you didn't get my drift here about our own tradition and the way w things we've claimed over time, we'll have a conversation later. And Paul responds to these reports by telling the congregation that he couldn't speak to them as spiritual people, but only as infants. Instead of giving them solid food, which they should be ready for by now, he had to continue giving them milk. In other words, he had to get, take them all the way back to the very beginning, go back to the basics before they could move on. Now, the word that we heard this morning comes from chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. And although Paul had already reminded them that they didn't lack in any spiritual gifts, it appears that they were neglecting spiritual gifts while they pursued spiritual experiences. And since Paul is getting back to basics in chapters 12 to 14 of the letter, he, re he redirects their attention from the pursuit of spiritual things to receiving their spiritual gifts that serve the common good. Chapter 12 opens with the words, now concerning. 
And back when I was in seminary, I learned that whenever you see those two words in 1 Corinthians, what you know is that Paul is about to give an answer to questions posed to him by the church in Corinth. You'll find this formula three other times in, first, in this letter of 1 Corinthians, but in this case, he answers the questions regarding, well, the way you read it in the NRSV concerning spiritual gifts. But probably a better translation of this is now concerning spiritual things. The translation, spiritual gifts, makes sense of the broader context because Paul is going to write about spiritual gifts, but that's not their question. They wanted to know about, and here's a Greek word for you, the Greek word for the day. They wanted to know about the pneumaticons. That is spiritual thing. That's the best translation of pneumaticon. They were asking about the pneumaticon while well, Paul wanted to talk about the charismata, the gifts of grace. Now, you might be wondering, what's the difference? Just Greek words, right? Well, here's the difference. When the Corinthians asked about the pneumaticon, they were focused on things that blessed and benefited themselves, spiritual experiences that would benefit themselves. But when Paul was talking about the charisms or the charismata, he was talking about gifts that would benefit others. You might call what the Corinthians were looking for were those kinds of things that might build their reputation in the church and in the community. You might call this seeking a spiritual high with the added benefit of increased social standing. And Paul contrasted that vision with that of the charisms, the gifts of the Spirit, which lead to, spirit, to service of others. Now, while we may receive spiritual benefits as a result of sharing our spiritual gifts, that isn't their primary purpose. Here is what I wrote in my book on spiritual gifts. I wrote a couple years ago. As we make use of spiritual gifts, we find that our hearts are turned to the other. In seeking to encourage the other, we find wholeness for ourselves. I believe that when I wrote the book, and I believe it today. When it comes to experiencing the presence of God's Spirit, Paul reminds us that the spirits are, that spiritual experiences need to be rooted in a confession, and that confession is Jesus is Lord. And that's because, he says, no one could say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This is the foundation Paul had laid at the very beginning when he founded that church in Corinth. And he was calling them back to their primary confession that Jesus is Lord. And then Paul closes chapter 3 of the letter by reminding the Corinthians that they belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. So if we say Jesus is Lord, then we're affirming that we belong to Christ, which means we then belong to God. And that is the starting point for our understanding what it means to be spiritual. When it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, Paul offers a number of lists, one of which we've already heard this morning in verses 8 through 10. That list isn't exhaustive. But it does offer some possibilities. And from the looks of things, this list kind of suggests what some of the interests of that particular congregation, the things that they were really seeking to have in their own lives, with a special emphasis for some reason on speaking in tongues. There's more about that in chapter 14, and we aren't going to be looking at that anytime soon. There are other gifts. There's a, a gift list. There's one in Romans, and there's one in Ephesians, and there's another list even here in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. And together they give us suggestions, but none of them, even taken all together, are exhaustive of the possibilities of the gifts of the Spirit that God provides us so that we might seek out the common good of all. Now, we'll talk more next Sunday about the relationship of spiritual gifts to the life of the church, which Paul calls 
the body of Christ. But he gives a hint about what that means here in verses 4 through 6, where he writes, There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. Here's Paul's point. We're all different. Every one of us is a different individual. And yet, we are part of a community. We have different gifts and different callings, but we are all bound together by the one Spirit in Christ so that we might live faithfully in the presence of God. Paul wrote to this congregation so he could bring them back to their foundation. The foundation he had laid five, four or five years earlier. This foundation, which Paul had laid, included the message, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. We are gathered here this morning in the season of Epiphany, which calls our attention to the ways in which God is made manifest in the world. And in writing to the Corinthian church, he tells us, because we're part of his audience, not directly, but indirectly, he's telling us, he's reminding us that each of us has been given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good so that the presence of God might be made manifest in the world. And since each of us has been given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, we can also affirm that these manifestations of the Spirit are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. Now concerning spiritual things, Paul does not want us to be ignorant or uninformed. While he'll admit to having spiritual experiences, he emphasizes those gifts that lead to the common good. He wants us to know that every gift of the Spirit is intended to be used for the building up of the body of Christ. Every gift is equally important. Now, some gifts and some callings are more visible than others, but there isn't a gift hierarchy. There is no spiritual hierarchy in the body of Christ. Simply because some gifts are more visible to it than others doesn't mean that they are more important. They're just different. So there are a variety of gifts but one spirit. The church of Jesus Christ is diverse in its gifts and callings, but according to Paul, God would have us live together in unity. And this begins by moving from spiritual things to spiritual gifts, which then leads to spiritual maturity. Finding unity, though, in diversity isn't easy, especially when there are so many spiritual options out there that are available to us. Most of the members of the Corinthian church came out of a polytheistic religious background. And we know this because Corinth was full of temples to dedicated to a great variety of, of deities. And each of these deities had its own appeal. Some traditions attracted the wealthy, some the educated. Other attra tra traditions attracted the military. And still others spoke to the concerns of the common laborer. In other words, religious life in Corinth was socially segregated and stratified. Unfortunately, many of, many of these social divisions that existed in the community were brought into the church and were being expressed through individualistic spiritual pursuits. While our context here this morning is somewhat different, the same elements of societal division and, and stratification and faction and division well, they do infect our churches as well. Which is why Paul continues to call us back to the common good. Now, speaking simply as disciples, that one of those groups that has claimed 
that we are above factions because we're Christians only. We affirm both diversity and unity in the church. The question is, how do we find true unity in our diversity? In other words, how do we, as a diverse people of God, even in this congregation, pursue the common good? As we ponder these questions, we return to the opening question posed to Paul. So what about the pneumaticon? And his answer was simple. To each has been given a manifestation of the Spirit, as the Spirit chooses. Or in the words found in the Ephesian letter, these gifts, these charisms are given to the church so we might come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Christ.